please welcome Andrew Tridgell. Thanks very much. So um, this year I'm going to be talking about uh, helicopters and rocket planes, um, which is really just a, a short summary of some of the crazier things we've been doing over the last year and that we're preparing to do over the next year in the world of open source autopilots. Um, there's massive amounts of development going on in, in free software autopilots at the moment um, and I just had to pick a, a few little bits out of it that I thought might have been of interest. So where I got started in open autopilots was with a competition. Um, I was at the local hacker space uh, in Canberra, Make Hack Void. Uh, there's a number of Make Hack Void members here, I believe, today. And there was, was my first meeting at Make Hack Void, and there was a little huddle of people in the corner. And uh, they were chatting about, you know, model aircraft and trying to, you know, drop bottles on people, and, and that sounded interesting. So I walked up to the group and asked if they wanted a software engineer, uh, somebody who could perhaps, you know, write some of the software for what they were planning to do. So what they were working towards was the Outback Challenge. Um, and the Outback Challenge is a robotics competition which is held every two years in Queensland and is trying to push the boundaries of amateur autopilots. And challenges like this are really a wonderful way to push things along. So the challenge at the time was to fly a plane about a total distance of around 70 kilometres or so and use an onboard camera to find a lost bushwalker and then um, once you've found them, automatically drop them a rescue package which was represented by a water bottle and then fly back and automatically land. So auto takeoff, auto search, automatic image recognition, fly back and auto land. So that was, ran for seven years uh, before finally um, teams completed it. So in the 2014 challenge, uh, nobody had completed the challenge before 2014. Um, we uh, won on points in 2012, we didn't actually complete the challenge. Then in 2014, we had several teams in one year complete the challenge. And our team was lucky enough to get the closest um, uh, hit to Outback Joe and without actually hitting him, which is important, and, and one managed to win the prize. So once that was completed, the organisers said that you know, if anyone completed the challenge, they'd try to make it harder. And the challenge for this year is that next challenge, the, the, um, to, where they're trying to make it harder, because it's, you know, flying 70 kilometres unattended and recognising and dropping things is all too easy these days. Um, you know, that's now an out-of-the-box experience where um, you can just download an autopilot that does that for you. So now we need to make it a bit harder, and they're particularly pushing an aspect of autonomous flight, um, vertical takeoff and landing. Because one of the problems with the solutions that, we, that all of the teams came up with last time is they all need a runway. And as yet, we don't have legislation that requires that bushwalkers get lost within five kilometres of runways. <laughs> so they realised that perhaps some ability to take off and land vertically would actually be quite important. Um, so they came up with this new concept called the Outback Challenge Medical Rescue. And you can see it on the, on the picture there. The idea is you take off at one point where the little yellow aircraft is sitting there in the top left corner, and you need to fly a total distance of around 60 kilometres, so 30 kilometres to a destination and 30 kilometres to get, get back. This time round, you know roughly what the destination is and you know roughly what the flight path is. And the backstory is that Outback Joe has got some medical condition where he needs some analysis of a blood sample um, urgently and the, all the roads are blocked and for some reason, you know, nobody can get to him. Um, the idea is that a, a UAV goes out and picks up a blood, blood sample off Outback Joe and brings it back. And um, you're not allowed to collect the blood sample using a propeller. Uh, you have to actually land more than 30 metres away from Joe. If you get within 30 metres, then you're instantly disqualified. So the, a lot of the challenges around airframes that can do vertical takeoff and landing, um, there also is, you've got to pick a landing site. Um, in the last challenge, the takeoff and landing was happening within a couple of hundred metres of where the operators of the aircraft were sitting. So we saw the aircraft take off and we see the aircraft land. 
And any of you who have had anything to do with aviation will know the takeoff and the landing is really the hard bit. Uh, so this time, the landing and the takeoff are happening 30 kilometres away. Right? So you've got a communication link, you've got a challenge to keep communication up to that vehicle 30 kilometres away. And you've got to, or line of sight, it will be less than 30 kilometres, so it's 30 kilometres, you know, via the path. But you've got to keep that communication link up, and then it's got to autonomously land, and it has to be a vertical landing. There is no runway. And you're not even told exactly where, you know, a good landing spot is. You've got to use image recognition and work out a landing spot, and then land at that remote site, and then shut down completely. And that's difficult. You have to turn off any motors, right? So you've got petrol motors for shutdown. And then Joe walks up and puts the blood sample on the vehicle and presses a button, and one minute after the button press, you're allowed to start up the motors. You know, start it up too early and you'll collect a second blood sample um, <laughs> if Joe is still standing too close. So uh, they press the button, the blood sample gets loaded, and then it's got to fire up its, its motors and take off vertically and then fly back via the flight path and come back and land at the, at the original site. So um, the, the computer vision task this time is in many ways easier because you know roughly where Joe is, so really there's only a few images you need um, just to find a suitable landing point. Um, and so you know the position of Joe to within 100 metres, um, but you've got to then try to land accurately on a good spot without, you know, landing on top of a bush or a tree or something like that. Uh, and, but a lot of it's to do with the vertical takeoff and landing side of things. So um, how do you do this vertical takeoff and landing? And as soon as the, the rules came out, we realised there were two really obvious um, solutions. One is helicopters and the other would be a quad plane. So I'm going to describe a little bit about each of those and uh, what we've been doing with them. Um, Canberra UAV, we're a sort of a group of amateurs and sort of enthusiasts, um, crazy people as we're known by the other people who fly model aircraft around Canberra. And uh, so we decided that we wouldn't just bet on one of these, we'd do both, right? So we'd learn all about helicopters and we'd learn all about quad planes, we'd build both and fly both. And I mentioned there's a bit of a communications problem where you've got to have constant communication to your vehicle, even though it might be on the ground 15 kilometres away. And that is a challenge for radio technology over unknown terrain. So the solution is that you have two aircraft. So you actually have a second aircraft acting as a radio relay. So uh, quite likely we'll end up with both a helicopter and a quad plane flying in this mission, one acting as a radio relay for the other. Um, so they have very different autopilot needs, helicopters and quad planes. Um, so I'm going to, uh, but they, the key is they both offer long range and high speed. Roughly speaking, you need to fly for 100 kilometres an hour for around 45, 50 minutes and take off and land vertically, which makes it very difficult to do a pure electric aircraft to do this. The energy density of batteries really just isn't up to it. You might be able to, to squeak it in, but um, not with the sort of, you know, rough and ready engineering that uh, characterises Canberra UAV, where, you know, the sticky tape and hot glue and zip ties are, you know, a lot of our, a lot of our kit. Um, it would have to be a very refined aircraft to try to do it pure electric. So I'll talk a bit about what we've been doing with um, helicopters first. So helicopters are hard. Um, they are basically flying vibration generators with rotating swords at the top. Um, and the vibration in particular are, you know, absolutely mad, uh, really mad vibrations. And that's a problem for an autopilot that's trying to do this perfect control. Um, and a lot of helicopters are derived, uh, are really aimed at 3D flight, you know, incredible aerobatics. Who's seen the sort of aerobatics that model helicopters can do? Yeah, if you haven't, just do some YouTubing and it's just amazing to, to see exactly what people manage to do with model, air, with model helicopters. Um, so they're, they're difficult to scale up, uh, particularly as the smaller ones tend to be electric and the vibrations aren't quite so crazy. As you scale up to, say, two-stroke petrol engines, then the vibration goes up. And you scale up again, you might go do a large four-stroke engine. The vibrations get really insane. 
Uh, and so, of course, we're aiming for that higher size, um, where we've got you know, a 50cc four-stroke engine um, and uh, uh, nearly two metres of, of blade uh, length, blade diameter, uh, and uh, a copter that'll probably weigh in at about sort of 12 to 14 kilograms uh, when it's got all its payload on it. So that's a, the, towards the larger end of model helicopters. Um, and so this is a picture of one of our prototype helicopters. That's a, a JS-90, which was originally a, a nitro um, a helicopter, but um, we've replaced the engine with a 15cc petrol engine because the petrol uh, gives a, great, a much higher degree of efficiency, and we wanted that 100 kilometres an hour for an hour type benchmark. Um, and helicopters can do that. They can, they can carry significant payloads over long distances um, really quite fast. Uh, they are incredible machines. So helicopters are hard, but they're also very rewarding. Um, they are extremely efficient at VTOL. And basically, it's the, it's the large disk area. Larger propellers are more efficient. And helicopters are the biggest propellers. Right? Enormous propellers. That gains an awful lot in efficiency. And once they're flying at fast forward flight, they have this interesting property where their efficiency can actually increase as they speed up. Hovering is actually harder for a helicopter and can use more fuel than, you know, moderate forward flight. Once eventually drag catches up with you and really fast forward flight, the efficiency drops again. But it's a much flatter curve than most other types of, of aircraft. Um, Petrol, you need a petrol helicopter for really high energy density to be able to do long range at high speed. They have amazingly high precision control. Um, and so they can uh, cause, the, the, the controls on a helicopter can cause the, the vehicle to sort of rotate at 720 degrees a second or more. So just sort of flip, flip, flip like that, as you see in the 3D videos. And that gives them amazing degrees of uh, control in high wind massive gusts of wind, um, uh, you know, might, might, uh, they can handle that really well, which is very attractive because in the rules of the Outback Challenge, they continue to run the competition if the um, average ground speed at the point of takeoff is below 25 knots. So they only call a halt to the competition if the average goes above 25 knots. Now, 25 knots for a model aircraft is a heck of a lot of wind. Um, in the last competition, the limit was 20 knots. They said they wouldn't fly if, if the average was above 20 knots. Uh, both times we flew in the competition, we had more than 20 knots. And even though that was the rule, because that was 20 knots on the ground at the, at the time of takeoff. Once you get into the air and you're flying out of the field, you know, the wind starts coming up. So it is a, w a windy area of the world, or it can be, particularly if you're flying in the afternoon. And so being able to handle really high wind is a very attractive feature of helicopters. OK, so um, here's, a, here's a video of, of our larger helicopter. This is a GX-9. This is uh, a 900-class helicopter with a 50cc petrol motor. And um, you're probably getting a bit of a sense from the sound there. And it's a bit hard to see the, the picture of this. I probably should have zoomed in a little more. But they are, it is vibrating like mad, absolutely vibrating like mad. And um, it is being stable, stabilised by a small flight controller. And uh, it's, you know, just hovering around. But this is what they look like. Um, and uh, the idea is that this will fly, you know, 30 kilometres away um, and then land and then, you know, shut itself down completely. This one's got an, an, a starter motor to auto start. So we can press a button and it starts the motor, uh, which is really attractive, of course. That's all built in. And they're quite amazing machines. But um, things can also go, go wrong. So if you have a look at this little graph on the right here, um, it tells a, a story about controlling helicopters. So, um, you know, we have our little autopilot on board and we can tell it to capture all of the sensor data at full rate. So that means it's capturing the, um, the, the, the primary accelerometer at one kilohertz and it's capturing the secondary accelerometer at 1600 hertz. So that's a lot of data it captures. And then we can run FFTs over that. So this is the result of an FFT of flying that JS-90 uh, that I showed you before, the one, the sort of the close-up photo. And 
The interesting thing is where these peaks are, the horizontal axis here is in hertz, and if you can't see it, the first little number there says 100 hertz, so that first peak is around, you know, uh, 23, 24 hertz or so. And um, that is the um, rotation speed, that's basically the, the period of rotation of the rotor blade. So it generates this oscillation around 23 hertz or so. And then the second peak there is the blade passage frequency. So that's the frequency at which the individual, there's two blades, uh, are passing through the air. So you, it's double because there's two blades. Um, the control frequency with which you're aiming for to actually control these things is typically around 20 hertz. Now, um, that gives a bit of a problem. When you've got massive oscillations at 23 hertz and you're trying to control something at 20 hertz, then you can very easily get into massive control problems. So, um, isolation of the IMU is critical, but if you isolate it at 23 hertz to get rid of that noise, then you're also isolating it at your control frequency. And you need the data at the control frequency in order to be able to control it. Because if you get rid of the data at your own control frequency, you can't control it. So this is where helicopters get really hard, particularly as the scale up. The smaller helicopters, the frequency and the rotation rate of the blades is much higher. That might be 30, 40 hertz, giving you a bit of a gap between your control frequency and your, um, the, the vibration. So what, actually, what problems does this cause? So this is a graph of a flight which was less than successful. Um, and um, what we're seeing here, now again the numbers might be a little bit small. Um, so on the left-hand axis, we're seeing the amplitude of the... The red line is the amplitude of the accelerometer, right? Our, just our vertical accelerometer, just one axis of it. Um, and the scale there, the first number past the midpoint is 100 metres per second per second, so 10G. And you can see there that the, there's this band. On the left-hand side, it's flying beautifully, right? The left-hand side there, really nice flight, beautifully stable, Lovely helicopter. And you can see there that peak to peak, it's generating about 6G worth of vibration, right? So that's fairly normal for a helicopter. So 6G is actually a lot of force, right? And that's just in normal, stable flight, vibrating up and down at 6G. And then we see this, this phase of the, the graph in the mill there, where it's a little more than 6G. And uh, to get you an idea of the scale, so after 100 comes 200, then 300, um, our accelerometers, we've got, uh, in this particular vehicle, we had uh, two sets of accelerometers, an MPU 6000 and an LSM 303D. Both of them um, are linear up to a maximum of 16G, right? So 160 metres per second per second, and it starts going bad. The MPU 6000 actually clips at 16G, the LSM 303D just starts going non-linear above 16G, and then it absolutely clips at 24G. And you may notice there's this um, little part of the graph there which you never want to see in a flight log of a model aircraft, which is a very flat top. And you can guess what number that is. That's, you know, 24G. And so the aircraft, in the space of a, a couple of seconds, went from um, 6G of vibration up to saturated 24G and probably extrapolating it, it was more like 30, 35G, something like that. Peak to, um, and, uh, you know, peak to peak, it's more like 70G. So that's a lot of vibration. So the cause of this was a very small change in the tuning on the pitch controller. And that's what those blue and, yellow and green lines are. They're the um, control inputs and control outputs of the... Um, the tilt of the swash plate. All right, the swash plate is the part of the helicopter that twists the blades to allow it to control its attitude. And there's, a, there's three little servos on the swash plate, uh, what's called CPPM mixing, where you've got two servos that really control the roll and one servo that controls the pitch for moving the helicopter, you know, pitching forward or pitching up. And then the three of them combine to give what's called the collective, which is basically how much it, it climbs or descends, how much you know, lift or thrust downwards it, it gives. And we just did a tiny tweak, just wafer thin, as they say in Monty Python, a little tiny tweak to the pitch control. 
and suddenly we got catastrophic feedback in the control algorithms. Um, and the pitch controller went out of control and started feeding back on itself, right? Because the oscillation is around the same frequency as our control frequencies. And so we, when it saw a movement this way, it, it pushed back the other way and we ended up getting a build-up. And the whole helicopter just was shaking like mad. Um, now what happens is that at that point we're running a, a, a Kalman filter which is basically a sensor fusion technique for taking all of the different sensors, the GPS and accelerometers and gyros and compass and barometer and laser rangefinder and, you know, all these different sensors and fusing them all together and trying to get the state of the vehicle, you know, where it is and what its attitude is, right? And how, you know, all its velocity, etc. cetera. And uh, the, the Kalman filter basically lost the plot, right? And it no longer knew which way was up, um, and once a helicopter doesn't know which way is up, you know, it very quickly tries to, to go to where it thinks it wants to go, but it actually isn't going there, and there was an inconveniently placed tree, which uh, wasn't where the helicopter thought, you know, it, it thought it was over here, and the tree, it was actually over near the tree, and bang, all over in a couple of seconds. Uh, and uh, we actually dropped the tuning factor down. It, you can see that it did recover in terms of oscillation, but it, by that stage, it had lost the plot as far as the, the attitude of the aircraft was no longer controllable. Um, and when they go wrong, they go very badly wrong. But when they go right, they're wonderful. So here's one going right. This is a, um, a, the JS-90 helicopter doing an automatic takeoff and automatic flight, so a fully autonomous mission. So this is running our little autopilot software. It takes off like that. You can see a lot of vibration still. And then once it's done this automatic takeoff, it then transitions to forward flight and starts off around a fully autonomous mission. And this particular mission, it got up to around 100 kilometers an hour. Um, and there was enough fuel on board for around half an hour's flight or so. Um, there it is, heading off on its mission and slowly speeding up as we command it. Um, so when they work well, they do work amazingly well. But um, there are challenges with the controlling of helicopters, principally because of that, the lack of gap between the natural oscillation frequency and the control frequencies. All right, so um, there are other solutions to uh, vertical takeoff and landing. And as I mentioned, we decided that we would investigate both. Um, and uh, we didn't know which would be the best for what we're doing. Plus, we like to have fun with building crazy aircraft. Um, so we decided that it would be fun to actually build um, both helicopters and quad planes. So you can see here the idea behind a quad plane. There's two quad planes that we've built. Um, and uh, so the bottom one was the one we first built, which is based on a, a venerable aircraft a design from back in the 1950s, I think, uh, called a senior telemaster. And uh, it's sort of balsa and covering. Um, and it's, what we've done is we've taken this basic aircraft, which is a petrol aircraft. It's got a 15cc petrol motor in the front. Um, a really nicely, you know, easy to fly aircraft. There's the, um, the catchphrase of the manufacturer is, you know, nothing flies like a telemaster. You know, they, they fly really beautifully. So um, we stuffed all that up. Uh, and uh, we stuck four quadcopter motors on this thing, on some uh, aluminium square section tube there, strapped underneath the wing. Then we stuck a whole bunch of batteries in it, lots of heavy batteries in it. And that thing was able to then take off vertically as a quadcopter and then um, transition to forward flight by starting the, uh, the petrol motor, right, which allows it to have the vertical takeoff capabilities of a quadcopter but the speed and endurance of a, um, of a fixed wing. And um, some people describe them as being like uh, splades or sporks where they're sort of, you know, not really a, a, a great knife or fork or spoon but able to do all of the jobs. And they're a bit like that. Um, whereas, so helicopters are a much more elegant solution to the problem. But um, in many ways, quad planes are simpler. And uh, from a control point of view, um, because the, you know, when they're in forward flight, it's relatively easy. Um, and flying them vertically, it's just a quadcopter. 
There is this transition phase where they're sort of halfway between being a quadcopter and a plane. And we initially expected that might be hard. And it turns out it's absolutely trivial. Um, and so the, the very first time we tried it, we actually just fitted two flight controllers. So we had two autopilots in that yellow plane. And we had two pilots on the ground that were, had two RC controls, one of them controlling the fixed wing and the other one controlling the quadcopter autopilot. And what happened was the quadcopter person just said, take up, and then just puts it into hover, right? And then tells the guy on the controls for the fixed wing to say, okay, start advancing the throttle and flying. And he started advancing the throttle and it flew forward and went off beautifully. And well, that was easy. Uh, it really was amazingly trivial. So then, of course, the task is to automate it. And the, we had a very strong motivation for automating it because um, the, we actually crashed that yellow one. And the reason we crashed it was essentially there were three pilots. There was one person holding the transmitter for the quadcopter part. There was one person holding the transmitter for the fixed wing part. And then there was me on the keyboard coordinating, right, and giving all the data and saying, we're going to do this. And so before each flight, we'd have a coordination session, you know, you're going to do this, then we're going to do that, etc. And on the very last flight of this plane, um, we, it was a human mistake in the coordination between the three pilots. Having three pilots in one aircraft is hard. And the wrong button was pressed, and it was hovering at about 10 metres, and the quadcopter turned off at zero speed. And the plane doesn't fly very well when it's just sort of sitting there with no motors vertically. You can put the forward throttle on all you like, but you're not going to suddenly accelerate up, not at a height of 10 metres, you can't recover. And so, of course, it tumbled into the ground and, and uh, you know, it now rests with all the other models that we've destroyed over the years. Um, so the top one we haven't destroyed yet, um, it's a smaller one. And it has just a single autopilot that completely automates the transition between these two flight modes. Um, and uh, so now just one person can flick a mode and we made it so there is no button that causes the aircraft to just tumble into the ground and, and flat and crash. You know, whatever you do, if, you, if, if you're just hovering there and you say flick to um, forward flight without any quadcopter, it will actually keep the quadcopter there and automatically hold it. If you put the transmitter down, it'll just sit there waiting for the next command, right, until you start saying, okay, now start accelerating forward and it won't... It'll, it'll slowly decrease the quadcopter motors as it gains airspeed and gains lift from the, from the fixed wing. So it's uh, um, much more foolproof, removing the, you know, the human a mistake element. Um, quad planes are somewhat difficult to, to scale, but first of all, I want to talk a bit about you know, why quad planes make sense. And that's really summarised by this graph. And this is a graph from a real flight of that quad plane, the top one on the previous slide, which was the electric foam quad plane. And you can see here there's two lines. There's the red line, which is the current in amps. This is an electric quad plane, pure electric, so one battery is supplying both the forward motor and the vertical motors. And then the, um, the green line is the airspeed. So at low airspeed, it's hovering, and at higher airspeeds, it's in forward flight. And what you can see is the red line is on average an awful lot lower once you're moving forward. Because in fixed wing flight, it's really efficient. And it's about a third of the current. Even though you're going much faster, right, you're getting the job done, you're only using about a third of the current. And that basically, why is that? Well, wings work. All right? Wings really are a very efficient way of, of getting along, which is why they're so popular in aircraft. <laughs> so... Towards the end of the flight, you can see there where it goes to low speed again, it transitions back to vertical flying, and suddenly the current leaps up, right? But then you need to multiply this graph by an extra multiplier. In forward flight, you can use a petrol engine, right? Because the control speed of petrol engines is low, but you don't need high control speed for the forward motor. And that gives you another, like, 20 or 30 times of, of efficiency, typically, um, as far as energy density is concerned. So um, the batteries in our quad plane, um, for, for our larger quad plane, might give you a couple of minutes of vertical flight. And that's with, you know, four or five kilos of batteries in a 19-kilogram plane. The petrol, which might be only a, you know, litre and a half, will give you maybe an hour at 100 kilometres an hour. Right? So you get this massive efficiency in forward flight. 
So let's have a look at what that looks like. This is our little foam test quad plane doing an, aut this is a fully autonomous mission, so auto takeoff, automatic transition to forward flight, and then an automatic mission, then come back an automatic landing uh, at the end. Uh, there it goes, a little bit unstable at the first, that's what quad planes are a bit awkward when they're getting off the ground. And now it's quite stable once it's in the air, and then it'll start transitioning to forward flight. Now notice it actually goes backwards for a second. And that's because it pitches up. This version of the code pitched up to try to climb, and that causes the quad motors to make it go backwards for a second or so. That's actually been fixed in a later version of the code. And there it is, heading off on its autonomous mission. And then at the end of that, it'll come back and do an automatic landing and come back and land at the airfield. So one button, fully autonomous VTOL missions, which is great. Um, it's really nice to sort of to see that working. We just got to scale up to a much larger size. So, enough on, on quad planes. Now I'm going to talk about something totally different. I promised you rockets, right? I said, I said uh, helicopters and rocket planes. And uh, one of the problems with, with conferences is you've got to put in um, the description of your talk a very long time in advance. And I was hoping that this mission that I'm going to be talking about now would have been completed and we would have had the, the video of the resulting crater in the ground um, <laughs> to show you. Unfortunately, that video hasn't been produced yet, so I'm just going to talk about what we have done with this rocket plane mission. So what you see there, that um, you know, very patriotic British uh, aircraft, um, is from the the Register Special Projects Division. You know, so the Register is a um, uh, a wonderful IT site with uh, you know controversial approach to reporting IT news, and um, they also have this special projects division, which they did like for example the Paris project, which was the first paper airplane in space. Um, and their their project for the last few years has been this Lowen project, which is the low orbit helium assisted navigator um, uh, project. And the idea is that that plane will uh, be taken up to 20 kilometres in a balloon and then fire a rocket and get up to Mark II. And then when the rocket expires, then an autopilot will take over and bring it back and land it at Spaceport USA. So it's a really ambitious mission. And it's a 3D printed aircraft, which is unusual. So lots of unusual things. You know, it's hard enough making a, a good aircraft um, out of normal materials, but to actually make one that can handle, you know, Mark II with uh, 3D printing is really quite a challenge. So this is the basic idea of the mission here, and um, so this is their like pictograph of it. So the phase one, you have a weather balloon that takes that plane on this great big metal scaffolding. Um, up to a height of 20 kilometres, right? And the idea is the balloon will burst just above 20 kilometres. So it takes it all up, it's got on board, it's got a little Raspberry Pi, right, running Raspbian on board, and it's got our little autopilot, one of these autopilots here, uh, a little Pixhawk autopilot running ArduPilot, and it's got a bunch of radio gear, uh, again running firmware that, that we've developed. And um, when the balloon, the, so, Phase two begins when it fires off this rocket. So in, if inside the, the tube part of the plane there, there is a rocket. And um, that rocket gives it about an eight second burn time and accelerates the aircraft up to, uh, they're hoping to get to around Mark II. Uh, the, the autopilot's job is uh, on the way up, it's supposed to just wiggle its servos to stop them freezing up, because it gets pretty cold up at 20 kilometres, right? That's one of the coldest points of the atmosphere. And uh, so it's wiggling its servos to sort of get up there, and then, um, and then it's supposed to hold very still when the rocket goes off, because it really doesn't have a chance of controlling it in the rocket phase of the flight. So the idea is don't even try and control it and just hope that it goes straight. There's a lot of hoping in this mission. Um, <laughs> So uh, it'll probably lose GPS at the time when it goes into rocket phase because it'll be past the, the limits in the, what the U-blocks will do in the, as far as velocity. And um, so then after the rocket burns out and it's had a few seconds to, to start slowing down a little bit, um, the autopilot takes over and um, flies it, hopefully flies it all the way back to the, the base and lands neatly at Spaceport USA. Mm. 
So there are some challenges to this as far as the autopilot's concerned, but uh, I'm always up for a you know, crazy challenge in autopilot development. So the easy bits are sort of the you know, wiggling servos during the ascent. We've added a, a special you know, wiggle servos mode you know, while waiting for the ascent. And then it's got a very simple little bit of code that just looks at the accelerometer to detect the, the rocket acceleration. And as soon as it sees that massive acceleration, just to lock the servos in place and hold them still, you know, and while it sort of prays that it's going to survive this, that the 3D printed plane can actually handle that degree of acceleration. Um, the interesting part of it is the fact that this plane, it'll, this flight will be its first flight. Uh, normally, when you're building model aircraft, how many of you have built and flown model aircraft at all? I've quite a few. Okay. So you know that you know, the first flight is rarely perfect, um, especially the first flight of such an ambitious aircraft. And you know, you've got to get your rates right, you've got to get your all your tuning parameters, and you might need to shift the C of G a little bit and trim the aircraft. Well, this thing's going to be at 20 kilometres flying at Mark II in very little air. And um, the picture that comes to mind for me if you're a fan of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, you may remember the infinite improbability drive. And there was a, a whale that popped into existence above a planet. And the whale pops into existence and it then has this philosophical discussion with itself where it sort of sees the ground and, you know, I uh, think, ooh, will it be my friend? And uh, then it sort of discovers, ooh, I've got these, these flipper things. I can flip them and they do things, right? So that's what the plane's going to be like. It's, it's, it's never flown before, it doesn't know its tuning factors, so we added the ability to... We've got this auto-tune mode, which is normally under pilot control, where you fly it around and it learns how to fly. So the plane needs to learn how to fly on the way down through the atmosphere. And um, hopefully it learns enough about the theory of flight and, you know, how to control itself on the way down that it's able to then, you know, neatly uh, come in for the landing. Um, there is, however, a, a slight issue that knowing the altitude to land at is going to be somewhat difficult because it, it just has a, uh, a barometer on board for altitude and barometers tend to get a little bit upset when you drop them down to minus 50 degrees C and you, you, know, you have them going uh, for a, a couple of hours in a weather balloon and things and so it's supposed to then you know, know its height um, and um, we're hoping that it will try and land you know, on the runway, but it might like, decide to land 10 metres under it or you know, 10 metres above it or something, and that could get interesting. Anyway, so uh, we need to do a, a, lots of test flights. So we can't test flight the actual plane. Um, this is like uh, you know, one use. So we just test flight all the avionics on board, the bits of electronics and the servos and the autopilot. So uh, we worked with um, the uh, EDGE uh, team in the US that works on high altitude ballooning, a fantastic group of people, and they did a test flight for us on their balloon uh, where we were able to test at least that the code worked, the autopilot could survive the temperatures, that the sensor data looked good, that the servos you know, didn't freeze up, that type of thing. So we had this little payload in a styrofoam box and the airspeed sensor sticking out on the left there uh, because the airspeed freezing up was a potential issue. And, um, and then that's the balloon launch on the bottom left corner there. And uh, we ended up getting uh, a good flight. So what you can see here is uh, a, a bit of the data we got back from this flight. And I, I found the temperature data quite fascinating. Um, back to sort of harks back to geography lessons in high school. So the red line there is our altitude um, uh, above sea level. And you can see there we got up to about 31 kilometres above sea level, which is fairly high for an autopilot. Um, but the, the yellow line is the external temperature. That's the temperature on the airspeed sensor, right? And you can see that that started up. The right-hand axis is temperature. The left-hand axis is height in metres. And the horizontal axis is time. And you can see there that the balloon was steadily, you know, the red line, the, the altitude rising. But the yellow line, the temperature decreases and decreases and decreases until it got to about minus 51, minus 52 degrees centigrade, so quite cold. But then the temperature starts rising again, which is the classic profile in, in the atmosphere because um, you've got the, uh, the, trop the troposphere that you know, we live in, and then at around 20 kilometres or so, which is roughly where we saw it, um, you get the tropopause and the temperature actually starts rising again as you get into the stratosphere. So this is then a, 
a stratospheric flight, flight, which is nice to see. You can also see the electronics temperature. The other temperatures are the temperature of the various sensors on board, the IMU temperatures and the, S and the barom barometric temperature, and they never got below zero. They never froze. Uh, so the electronics stayed sufficiently warm and, and things, which was good. So the, the other thing we were trying to test in this flight was uh, the radio link. And because we, you know, of course, code works first time every time. Everyone knows that. Um, so we should trust our code. But just in case, you know, there may be a bug or two, we're going to have a telemetry link and be able to get live telemetry back to Australia, uh, where I'll be sitting in my home in Australia, monitoring the telemetry in the flight, and being able to nudge the auto-tune algorithm uh, as needed to try to get it to uh, land at the right airport. And um, so the radio link was critical for that. And what you can see here is the distance from home, which got up to 35 kilometers as you know, line of sight. And um, you can see that the radio link, there was only a few dropouts in that flight. And the cause of them, see on the left there, the yellow line is the background noise in the aircraft. And it was great when it was first turned on, but then a few minutes after the whole system was first turned on, suddenly the noise rose quite considerably, from about an RSSI of 60 up to about an RSSI of 85 or 90. Uh, so a difference between 60 and 85, uh, that's a 25 RSSI, which is about 12 dB. So we suddenly got 12 dB more noise from something else in the payload, because this wasn't an exclusive payload. So there was some other radio transmitter. And what we could see is that the, when we extrapolate out the potential range of this radio, we would have got um, you know, 150, 200 kilometers um, with a one-way link you know, coming from the aircraft to the ground, because very low noise on the ground. The green line is the noise floor on the ground station. The yellow line is the noise floor in the aircraft. And it's really just reinforcing the old lesson of these types of radios, which is, you know, the biggest limitation on your range is actually your noise floor and trying to get rid of those noise sources. And so we had a severe noise source, RF noise source, uh, at the 900 megahertz band, and that caused us to get a number of dropouts. We still, it was still controllable the whole time, but we would like to get rid of that, that noise floor. So as I said, we were hoping to actually have done the mission by this conference and that I was going to present the, you know, the flight videos, etc. Uh, instead, we've, got, um, we've been waiting for permission from the FAA because they're, for some reason they are slightly sceptical about the mission and it seems to be taking a while to get, get permission. So we have commemorative waiting for the FAA mugs for the mission um, and we have this, you know, this art of sitting around waiting for the, for the FAA. So it's, uh, that's what it's generated so far, plus the test flights. But I hope that sometime in the next few months we'll get the go-ahead and, and do the mission and um, hopefully neatly land at Spaceport USA. Okay, so there's a lot of other development happening in the hardware uh, area as well. Um, there's uh, been massive amounts of new autopilot boards uh, in the last year, so it's a wonderful time to get into open source autopilots. So if you're you know, on the edge and wondering, you know, do I want to do open source autopilots? Yes, it's great fun. Flying robots, really, what could be better? So I was going to show you a few bits and pieces. Um, there's this little one, which is actually the same sort of one that's the prize for the raffle, so you should go and enter the raffle. This, this actually runs Linux, this is called a Bebop runs Linux, and it now runs ArduPilot as well. Uh, we've been collaborating with the manufacturer, and so ArduPilot is an option, so you can run a, a full open source autopilot stack on this little Bebop, and it's a wonderful little computer, fantastic work being done by the people at Parrot. Um, there's also the bottom right there, the 3DR Solo. Um, you can walk into Harvey Norman and buy one of those things in Australia, and it is running and the open source ArduPilot autopilot, uh, which is you know, it's fantastic that you just walk into a store like Harvey Norman and buy yourself a open source autopilot drone. Absolutely wonderful. Uh, very, very capable system. Uh, it's got uh, a two computers, one running a Pixhawk 2, which is this one, and one running, a, uh, running Linux uh, for the communication and the extra shots and that sort of thing. Uh, another very interesting one lately is this one. This is the Qualcomm flight board which is a Snapdragon uh, CPU, and Qualcomm's pushing this quite hard as the future of autopilots. And it is a wonderful piece of hardware, four ARM um, crate CPUs, 
uh, plus three DSPs, and the DSPs have a complete shared memory with the ARM CPUs. So all of the memory just shared, their own L1, L2 cache, but all the rest of memory shared. So we've got ArduPilot running on this, and um, it's, a, it's good and bad. It's, it's a marvelous piece of hardware, but the obvious place to run the autopilot is on the DSPs, uh, which we can do. We have two ports, one running on, the, on Linux on the crate CPUs, the ARM CPUs, and another port of ArduPilot running directly on the DSPs. Unfortunately, the DSPs run a proprietary RTOS uh, called Quirt. And so, you know, it's a little bit sad to think that we might be running on proprietary operating systems um, in future with uh, these autopilots. But it is an incredibly capable piece of hardware with built-in two cameras, a 4K camera out the front there and a 640-480 camera uh, below for doing optical flow, for positioning, like an optical mouse in the sky. Um, if you want the, the pure open hardware, open software um, experience, then the one on the bottom left, the BBB Mini, is for you, which is a, a kit for the BB, the Beagle Bone Black, um, a do-it-yourself kit for amazingly low money that uh, provides um, a fantastically capable autopilot on top of the Beagle Bone Black, utilising the programmable, um, the PRUs, real-time units for doing the, all the necessary real-time stuff. And another one is the Navio 2 in the top right there, which is based on the Raspberry Pi 2. It's a cape for the Raspberry Pi 2 that also provides an incredibly capable autopilot. So it's a wonderful time to, oh, the top left one, of course, is the PXF Mini based on the Raspberry Pi Zero, which is a really, really compact autopilot. The Raspberry Pi Zero is tiny and makes for a great basis for an autopilot in smaller aircraft. All right, so it's a great time to get into free software autopilots. Um, and I'd encourage you to, you know, go and have a look at our site, ardupilot.com, dronecode.org, which is a uh, collaboration between a whole different lot of um, autopilot-related projects, and the Canberra UAV site, which is our particular group of crazy people um, doing our particular thing for the Outback Challenge. So, and I'd also like to mention, um, please donate to the Software Freedom Conservancy, a um, uh, really good cause. So, um, you know, if you're here and you care about software freedom, um, I'd encourage you to donate. Uh, so, now I've got time for a, a few questions. Very sorry to say that time is up. All right. <laughs> Andrew, are you on the chats list that people can address sure, questions yes, there? Sure, yes, or just, you know, hijack me in the, uh, the tea and coffee. Yep, and then people will see the responses, so that'd, that'd be great. Okay. Thank you very kindly. Okay. V very interesting talk. Thanks, Keith. On behalf of LCA, a small token of our gratitude. Thank you. Thank you.